be where we are today if it weren't for you, if it weren't for your Holy Spirit leading us, Father. And so we just invite you to come and move, for you to mold our hearts to be ready to hear your word, Lord. And we know that you are so powerful. And in this next song, um, this new song that we're about to sing, it's called I Seek Jesus. Um, and it just really talks about you know, letting God enter every conversation, every place, every work office that you may be at, every hospital, every um, tough decisions, every um, difficult relationship. Um, and we just speak Jesus over it because we know that he can do and he has done everything. Um, and he is that powerful. He is that powerful. And so we just want to speak Jesus into every moment, into every difficulty, into every temptation, into every dark place in our hearts that we don't even want to tell others. He's there. He's there and he can go there because once we let him, he can do amazing things and he can do miraculous works. So Father, just come and be in this place. Come and be in our hearts. May we just focus on you and fix our eyes on you, even though it's difficult. You know, coming into your presence really reveals a lot about who we are, and sometimes it's so difficult. It's so hard to swallow the pill that we are prideful. It's so hard to swallow the pill that we become impatient, and selfish at many times. But thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you allow us to move past that and to learn from how you lived your life. And so we just want to speak Jesus over every asset of our lives. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows of Let's all be seated. And this morning as we pray, let's truly appreciate and understand what a privilege it is to come before the God who created the heavens and the earth, the Almighty One. And yet we are invited to call Him our Father which art in heaven. Our Father in heaven, we are pleased to be here this morning. We thank you for causing us to awake from our sleep and to look forward to a time of community and fellowship, not only with our brothers and sisters, but especially with you. You have invited us to be here, and we have come. And you never disappoint. You promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be there in the midst of them. And you are here today in this special place. And each and every one of us, we come with a unique set of circumstances and desires and longings in our heart. There are those who have come today with so much gratitude for a week that has been full of favor and blessings. And then there are those today who have come brokenhearted, having faced disappointments, needing answers, seeking comfort, some of us who have come might be confused in our mind, in our spirit, and we need clarity. We pray that we find that in your presence and in the speaking of your word today. And sometimes we don't even know what we want and how to pray. But we just seek you. We desire your best for us and your best through us. But we're grateful that you have come to meet with us this morning. We sense your presence. We are grateful for your spirit. And we look forward to hearing your word. So whatever we desire from you today, whatever we need from you today, we just look to the heavens and know that you will grant to us according to your will what you know is best because you are our Father and you care for us deeply. And therefore, we can cast our cares upon you because of the care you give to us. Be with us especially this morning as we study your word. Grant to us understanding. And may the peace of Christ truly fill our hearts and our minds 
as we are here today for worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good morning. So good to be here today. We're so glad that you have come to worship with us. Some of you might be watching us online. We're especially grateful that you're taking time out of your day to join us. Well, as we prepare our hearts to study God's Word today, I'd like to draw your attention to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. I will be reading the passage of Scripture from there, pick up our thoughts, and really tie this together with everything that we've been talking about in the last uh, couple of weeks. But Matthew, chapter 6, let me read, starting with verse 5. It says in the English Standard Version, And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We're asking the question, what does Jesus expect of us? We started this year by asking the question, do you consider yourself a disciple? And if so, do you define that as being a follower of Jesus Christ? That's what a disciple is. A disciple is not a churchgoer. A disciple is not someone who simply reads the Bible. A disciple is not simply the one who has religion. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. And what does a follower of Jesus do? He follows Jesus, truly follows Jesus. And so what we've been exploring the last couple of weeks is, What does Jesus want us to follow? What are the clear commands that we have in Scripture? Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. In other words, if you are not obeying the commands of Jesus, you don't truly love him, even if you think you do. Even though you have a bumper sticker in your car that says, I love Jesus, But if you're not obeying his commands, you do not love Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you love me, then you will do what I command. So we've been asking the question then, well, what is the command? What are the commands? There's many commands in the Bible. We're looking at key and important ones. And the last one that we talked about last week was the very first command that Jesus gave as he started his public ministry. The very first thing Jesus told us to do is repent. Remember that? Repent and believe. You cannot live the Christian life unless you begin with repentance because it requires us to turn from our ways, walk towards God. Well, today... We're not going to talk anymore about the first command Jesus gave, which is repent. But today we will talk about the one command that Jesus repeated quite often. And the second command is pray. Last week we learned he said, you must repent. Today we will learn that Jesus told us to pray. Now you might sit there and go, I don't need this sermon. I pray. We all pray. This morning I'm sure you prayed. So why do we need a sermon on prayer? I think we need a sermon on prayer is because sometimes our understanding of prayer is deficient. Let me ask this question. Who do you like spending time with the most? 
I'm talking about an earthly relationship. Who's the one individual in your life that you just truly, truly enjoy spending time with that person? If you're married, hopefully your spouse is in the list. If you're single, it could be a best friend, it could be a neighbor, it could be an office mate, it could be a, a, a long-distance relationship, you, you chat online. You know, the last couple of weddings I've done in the last 10 years, you know what's becoming a, a very common uh, way that couples meet each other is online. I've done so many weddings in this last 10 years where I asked a couple, where did you meet? Oh, we, we chatted online. So that's another way that we're learning in this modern world that people are connecting. Who is that one person that you truly, truly enjoy spending time with? And the second question is, when you are with that person, what do you do? When you are with that person, what do you do? My absolute favorite person that's not a god in my life is, um, is Anna. Just enjoy her, her company, you know. Um, I'm not a very sociable person. You know, I, I could live in my house for weeks and months and be okay. But if I'm home, I want Anna there, you know. And I'm not much of a talker either. So it's, for me, it's just she's there, you know. Um, I'll let you just guess which does most of the talking, okay. And I don't mind that she does all the talking most of the time, you know. I'm done with work. She comes home from work. We both ask each other the same question. How was your day? My answer is the same every day. Fine. That's it. Fine. Then sometimes, if I'm daring, I'll ask her the same question. How was your day? But you know that when you ask that question, you have to be ready for the answer. <laughs> and so before I ask her how her day is, I turn off the computer, close anything I'm reading, drop my pens and my pencils, and pay attention to her because I know my question will be answered. How was your day? And I will learn about her day because she loves to communicate what went on. I, I, know, I know the people she's worked with even if I haven't met all of them. I know her schedule at work. I know what her boss feels about her performance because she tells me. And just the act of sitting there and listening is just my happy place. It's just I'm glad she's home and, you know, we're here. Sometimes we don't even look at each other when we talk. Sometimes we have the TV on, you know, and there's no sound, just running, and we're both looking that way, but when we're communicating. Sometimes we cook together. Well, she cooks. Sometimes she'll say, I want to go cook. Uh, come, come sit in the dining room with me. We just, we just like each other's company. We enjoy each other's company. I want to go to the mall. Can you come with me? I'm like, oh, the mall. <laughs> but that's what she wants, right? Because Anna is my most favorite person to ever spend time with. And when, I, when you ask me the question, what do you like doing when you're together? My answer is, I don't care as long as we're together. We could be reading something separately. We could be watching the same, same show together. She can be talking to me. I can be talking to her. What we do together doesn't matter to me as much as the fact that we're together. I wonder if that's the relationship you have with God. Because even if you tell me you pray, when do you pray? For some people, we only pray when we need something from God. Right? Oh, I lost my job. I guess I need to ask for a job. Oh, I, money is short this month, so I guess I better get on my knees and ask for money. Right? Oh, I'm not feeling very well, so I guess I need to ask God to heal me or ask someone to pray for me. See, very often we think we pray, but what we really do is we just ask for things. 
And when life is okay, we don't pray. We forget that relationship. The reason it's important to understand Jesus' command to pray, because the command to pray is not an invitation to talk. As much as it is an invitation to be in God's presence and enjoy it. That makes sense? When Jesus tells us to pray, he's not telling us to just come up with all these words so that we can say something to him. When he tells us to pray, it's because he's inviting us to say, you need a relationship with me and my father, and prayer is the environment that makes that possible. And so when you only pray when you have a need, then you're not harnessing that relationship. You are using him. In essence. You know, when a child comes to you only when they need something, that's very sad. When a child does not relate to you, talk to you, spend time with you, but when they need something, they go, Dad, I need this. Mom, I need that. Mom, you know, school needs me to buy this, or I'm out of that. If that's the only time your child talks to you, you'd be upset. Because you're more than happy to provide their notebooks and their toothpaste and their pillows and their toilet paper and food. You're more than happy to do that. But what you want from them is a relationship. That's more important. And so the invitation to pray that we will study today is not so much what to say, how many minutes should we pray, how long should our prayer life be. That's not the issue we will talk about. The issue will be, How are you harnessing your relationship with a God who wants to spend time with you? Everybody prays. In fact, I read an article recently that even atheists pray on a regular basis. In an article entitled, Do Atheists Pray? This is what the author wrote. He said, yes, many atheists do pray. While they usually aren't praying to a specific deity, they often pray to their higher self, they pray to the universe, or just go through the motion as a way to reinforce positive, mindful thinking. Prayer isn't just for the religious. It has a deep cultural and psychological value that everybody can appreciate regardless of their personal belief. How come? Because everybody prays. In a few hours, all of the Bay Area will be praying. (laughs) I guarantee it. And all of Philadelphia will be praying. I don't care if you're Buddhist, Muslim, Catholic, Presbyterian, atheist, agnostic, hater of God, lover of God. In the next few hours, Philadelphia and San Francisco are all going to be in prayer. Because we all pray. When the car in front of you suddenly stops and you slam on the brakes and you don't know if you'll make it, you pray. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Right? Whether you believe in God or not. Even if you don't believe in God, but the doctor says your wife has cancer, you're going to say some kind of prayer to whoever is willing to listen out there. Because everybody prays. But the question is, do you have a relationship with the one to whom you are trying to speak to? That is the issue that Jesus wants to deal with. So let me deal with the basics of prayer, and then let's try to really apply it in a way that is meaningful. The first question that came to my mind when I see all these commands to pray is, why should we pray? Why should we pray? There's a verse in uh, Matthew 6, verse 8, that made me question why I pray. It says, when you pray, do not use many words. Do not be like the babblers. Look at this, listen to this line. For your father knows what you need before you ask. For your father knows what you need before you ask. I remember as a young believer reading that going, then why should I pray? If he already knows what I need, Before I ask, then why do I need to pray? Because in my mind, prayer was nothing more than asking. 
That's all I understood prayer to be. Prayer is when you ask God for something. But then there's a verse that says, even before you ask, he already knows. So it defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Why am I going to ask for something that he already knows I need? Because of what we said earlier, prayer is way more than asking. Prayer has as its core a relational goal. So why should we pray? Number one, we should pray in order to deepen our relationship with the God we claim to love. John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You realize how dangerous that statement sounds? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. The problem is most people skip the condition. The condition is, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask for anything and I'll do it. Why? Because if you remain in Christ and his word remains in you, you will only ask what is his will. And when you ask only what is his will, God has no problem answering that prayer. That makes sense? Without the relationship, the request makes no sense. Because you can ask God for anything without a relationship. God, I hate my boss. Kill him. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. Have you read the Psalms lately? That's a prayer. But is it a prayer in God's will? Is it a prayer born of a relationship with him? Probably not. Because if you remain in me and my words remain in you. So prayer primarily is to deepen our relationship. Secondly, prayer is to express faith. It's a means of expressing faith. Mark 9, 22. But if you can do anything, the man said, for my son with an unclean spirit, please have compassion on us and help us. Remember this story? The guy had a son with a, a, a disturbing spirit. And he says, if you can, help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible if you believe. All things are possible if you believe. In other words, this is an opportunity to exercise faith. This is an exer exercise in putting into practice what you claim is true about God. Because it's one thing to claim something to be true about God. It's another thing to believe that that is true in your life. How many of you believe that God heals? But how many of you are believing him for healing? How many of you believe that God provides? And yet you worry anyway. You can't believe that God provides and then worry. You have to choose one. And when you worry, you have negated the first claim. Right? Yeah, I tell this story all the time. You must have heard it a million times if you've been with this church. But remember the story where it, the, the, the missionary pastor in a farming community was going through a period of drought. And they said to the pastor, we are going to die this year if we don't raise our crop due to the drought. And the pastor said, this evening, let us come together to the church specifically to pray for rain that God will open up the heavens and we will have rain. The church was packed that night. Farmers, people who worked the field, people who relied on a good crop. The pastor stood up and he said, I changed my mind. We will not pray tonight. Go home. The people said, why? He said, none of you brought umbrellas. <laughs> You're going to pray for rain, but you don't have an umbrella. That means you're not expecting it to rain. Right? You can say, I believe God will provide my needs, but I'm still going to worry about it. Where's the faith? Number three, we pray because sometimes other people cannot pray for themselves. We intercede for them. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul said, Paul was in prison. So he said, continue to pray for us. Be watchful in everything with thanksgiving. At the same time, please pray for us that God may open a door for us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear 
which is how I ought to speak. Paul is in prison. He doesn't have a crowd. He can't stand in front of the town square to preach. So he said to the Colossians, pray that even in my condition, even though I'm in jail, please pray for me that God can still use me to preach the gospel. I need your prayer. I don't know how to make sense of this. I can't intercede for myself right now. I don't know the right thing to pray, so please pray for me. You know how God answered that prayer? While Paul is in prison, there's extra biblical material that tells us that so many prison guards came to know Jesus. You know why? They were chained to Paul for four to six hours a day, 24 hours in shifts. Can you imagine being chained to Paul for six hours? What do you think Paul will talk about? Jesus. And if you're a prison guard, you can't go anywhere. Can you imagine you're a prison guard, you're chained to Paul. Paul's like, Psst, do you know Jesus? And you're like, oh. for the next four to six hours, you're going to learn about Jesus. People were getting saved. Prison guards were getting saved like crazy. Why? Because they prayed for him that God would open a door even in that situation. Sometimes you pray because other people don't know how to pray for themselves. And you seek prayer because sometimes you don't know how to pray for yourself. So prayer develops a relationship with God. But guess what? Prayer also develops a relationship with others. Especially other prayerful people or people who long for prayer. You know, when I was in high school... I was known as the born-again Christian in my school. And people didn't understand what that was. Sometimes they'd make fun of it. Sometimes they'd tease you in a very good nature. No one was mean to me, but they would tease you. you know, for... But you know what? In times of crisis, I can't tell you how many classmates of mine would walk up to me in a moment of privacy and say, Ed, can you pray for me? This is happening in my home. I, I had a classmate who said, you know, my parents are on the verge of separation. Can you, can you just, the next time you talk to your God, can you pray for me? In the previous home that we lived, you know, we had, had a neighbor that we were quite close to. And he knew I was a pastor. And one time he just walked by my house. He saw me and said, um, the next time you talk to your God, can you mention me? Glad to do it. Happy to do it. I love that. And he knows I talk to God. He probably doesn't. So he said, the next time you talk to your God, can you mention me? I love that. I love how they see that you are a connection. And you don't make fun of people like that. But you understand that they long for that. You know, when people come to church only on Easter and only on Christmas... That's not an opportunity to, to ridicule them. That's an opportunity to be grateful that they showed up. Because I know some people, they go, oh, you're here because it's Easter. Oh, it's Christmas, so you're in church. Why? Why? Be glad that they have come. They seek prayer. They long a connection with, for a connection with God. Mother's Day is a, is a high attendance Sunday. Why? Because moms say to their kid, Please, just for me, show up in church. And a kid will gladly do it, no matter how much they hate God or the church or church people or church things. They'll show up for mom. And be glad when they do, because when they show up, they have an opportunity to hear the word. We pray for people. We pray for them all the time. You cannot pray and then not expect that. You can't pray for others. Remember when Peter went to jail and was imprisoned? And in this certain house, they started praying for Peter's release. What did God do? God sent an angel, opened up, unshackled Peter, opened up the doors. Peter was able to walk out, starts knocking at the door where the prayer was going on. A person named Rhoda answers the door. This is not Roderick Paulate if you're from the Philippines. But Rhoda opens the door, sees Peter, Shuts it and goes back to prayer. She didn't even believe it was Peter. They were praying for Peter's release. When the answer was there, they didn't even believe it was an answered prayer. Because in their mind, Peter is in prison. He can't be at the door. But prayer is an opportunity to pray for others, but also exercise faith. Because you're building a relationship with God, but you're also connecting with other people. 
which then begs the second question that I asked, what should we then pray for when we do pray? Now, this was my personal dilemma. Let me tell you a personal story at this point. You know, I, I came to Christ at the age of 13. And I, I joined, I became a part of this vibrant, you know, Pentecostal charismatic church, you know, that really believed in the power of the Spirit and, and the works of God, and which was awesome and, and it was such a great experience for me. But the one thing that turned me off was their teaching on prayer. Because almost everyone who taught about prayer in the church I grew up in made prayer sound very difficult to achieve and very lofty. People would talk about how, oh, I would come to God in the morning. I know I'd spend an hour on my knees and I'd just be seeking God in prayer. And I'm, I'm thinking, an hour on your knees? Oh, I'm not sure I could do that. And then I got connected to, if you're familiar with the, the Korean prayer revival of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, you know, so we were exposed to the, the Korean model. The Korean model was far more intense than the Filipino model. In, in the Korean prayer movement, I don't know if it's true now, because I know uh, Christianity is kind of dwindling in Korea right now, but in their, 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 the height of Christianity, you know, Koreans would wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning. They would go to prayer mountains all across Korea. At 5 in the morning, they would have prayer meetings every morning, every morning, every morning. They would pray, and they would pray for 2, 3 hours, some 4, some all morning. And that would be their prayer life. And I, I remember telling myself, my prayer life doesn't even come close to that. I did some missions work in Cebu. And when we were in Cebu, we, we tried that. We tried early morning prayers. And we did it every morning. I would get up at, you know, like four in the morning, get, get to the church in Cebu. And among the, the, the local members there, most of us would come to the church, stay for an hour, and then everyone had to go to school and work. But we had Korean missionaries who also joined us. You know what they would do? They would join us at five. We would go to work, school, do missions, whatever. When we came back to the church at noon, they're still praying. They're still where we left them. And that made me feel that I had a rotten prayer life. Because I, my prayer life was nothing close to that. Me, when I sit down or kneel to God in prayer, five minutes, I'm done. I've said everything I've wanted to say. I have nothing more in my mind. And I remember walking out of a five-minute prayer feeling so guilty because it hasn't been an hour. It hasn't been three hours. I just had a, a five-minute prayer moment with God because my understanding of prayer was deficient. I thought prayer was being on your knees or sitting down and just talking to God endlessly for hours. I failed to understand that it was really spending time with him, whether on your knees or in a chair or in a car or in a bus or doing your work, because Paul told the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. There's no beginning and there's no end to your time in prayer. You're always in prayer. How come? Because you should always be in relationship with God. You should always be in touch with God. When you're driving the freeway, it's an opportunity to be in prayer. When you're waiting in the waiting room of a doctor's office, it's an opportunity to be in prayer when you're hanging out. So I have learned to incorporate because the model I grew up with didn't work for me. So I had to come up with what worked for me. You know what works for me? Remember, I don't talk much other than what I do for a living, and it's because I get paid to do it, right? They pay me at the school. They, I get supported here in church, and so I, I, I talk. But outside of my work environment, I don't talk, and that includes prayer. I don't talk much when I pray. When I pray, I, I tell God what's on my mind. I tell God what's in my heart. But I spend most of my time doing other things. One of the things I do is I read a lot. And whatever I read, whether it's the Bible or uh, a Christian uh, book, an inspirational book, or even a secular book, I'm looking for opportunities to pray about whatever I'm reading. Because reading brings about issues and topics and things. If I'm reading about family, then 
then I start turning that into a prayer for my family and families in the church. When I'm reading about health, then I turn that into a prayer for health for me, for my wife, for my children, for my family. I turn my reading into prayer time because that works for me. Sometimes I'll, I'll pull out my guitar, I'll sit behind the piano and I'll just sing songs that I remember, or pull out a songbook and just sing along and, and that's a prayer for me. That's my prayer time. If you're not musical, then you can, you know, turn on the radio, pop in a CD or plug in your MP3 into your ears, and that becomes a time of prayer. When I'm alone in my car driving to a meeting, driving to some appointment, that moment in my time with God in my car is a time of prayer. So I'm not the type of person that will spend an hour or two in one spot for prayer. That's not me. I'm the type of person who lives life, and as I live life, I want to always be conscious that God is with me. And so I talk to him all the time, all the time. Sometimes out of desperation, sometimes out of need, but mostly my prayers, I want to talk to God because I delight in doing it. It's what I love to do. What should we pray for? Number one, we should pray for God's will. You know the hardest part of the Lord's Prayer? The hardest part of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a tough prayer. Sometimes we just repeat that mindlessly, but we don't know what we're asking. Do you know that when you ask God's will to be done, you will have to be willing for your will to change? For your plans to change. My plan was to be a medical doctor. It was so simple. Go to high school, do some pre-med something, go to med school, be a doctor. That was the plan. That was the plan. It didn't require talking to people in public. That's the best part about being a surgeon. I hated, I dreaded the idea that anything I do for a living would involve talking. I figured if I was a doctor, I'd just have to speak to a patient, and if I was a surgeon, the patient would be asleep anyway. He wouldn't need to speak to me. And then God calls me to ministry. Why? Why? Why the guy who hates talking? Aren't there others out there who actually enjoy this stuff? Talking drains me. It drains me. I'm losing energy right now. At this moment, I'm losing energy. <laughs> but then if you say, thy will be done, you're, you're almost daring him, aren't you? You're almost saying, let's see. Let's see if I'm really willing to align myself to what you want. Sometimes you might want to skip that part of the Lord's Prayer if you're not willing to obey. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, the way it is in your heart in heaven, let it happen here on earth. The way you will it, the way you desire it, the way you want it, let that be true here in my life. What else should we pray for? We're invited to pray for our needs. Nothing wrong with that. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer with thanksgiving and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with telling God what you need. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not a very Filipino, that's very Jewish, by the way. For, uh, to make this more relevant, give us this day our pot of rice. <laughs> give us this day our pot of rice. That's what the prayer means. The, the very staples that I need to survive each day. Give that to me. You're not asking for luxuries. You're not asking for an expensive car. You're not asking for a mansion. You're just praying for what I need this day. Give us this day. Notice there's no request for tomorrow. It's this day. Americans have forgotten that. Americans have forgotten how to trust God for daily needs because we just... We go to Costco. 
We buy, we buy weeks and months of daily bread. Right? Have you ever gone to Costco to buy two things? I mean, it never quite works. Have you ever gone to even a Safeway, not get a cart, because you're convinced you only need two cans of whatever? And then at the end of 10 minutes, you're the village idiot that's carrying a, a ton of things when carts are free. Because you saw this, this, that, and the other. What does your cupboard look like right now? Picture your refrigerator right now. Picture what's in it and picture your cupboard and your pantry. It's no wonder you don't ask for your daily bread. It's no wonder that that's a part of the prayer that doesn't make sense. Because you already have tomorrow's rice and you already have this Friday's beef and you already have next week's chicken. And there's no need to pray for this day, our daily bread. We've missed out on that. We're very scared. We, we are a culture that buys clothes just in case we need it. Not because we need it, but just because we might need it. So we'll go to the mall, we'll look at it, oh, this is so nice. This coat is so nice. But mom, it's summer. Yeah, but it will get cold this winter. <laughs> I might need it then, and so we buy it. We don't need it, but we buy it. Or we have cans of spam and whatever and things and we have meat in the freezer, we have stuff in the refrigerator and we'll still order out. We're a wasteful people, aren't we? God has already provided an abundance but we don't take advantage of the things that he has blessed us with. Meanwhile, there's people in this world that need the stuff you're hoarding. They need it now. There's naked people right now that need the clothes that are being unused in your closet. There's people right now who don't know what to eat tomorrow and need the cans of whatever that's in your pantry right now. Right now. Prayer makes you aware of needs. That's why in Jesus' prayer, there is no personal pronoun. It's only a plural. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day. It doesn't say give me today, my daily bread. It's give us this day, our daily bread. Because I know you will provide for me, but use me to provide for others too. When God blesses you in abundance, that's not for hoarding. When God blesses you in abundance, it's because he wants to use you as an instrument to bless other people. And don't be afraid to give things away because where it came from, there's more. Do you save things for a special day? We won't open this until a special moment. You know what's a special moment? Somebody's hungry right now. They need a special moment. You need to open that can, give it to them. Prayer makes us aware because we're in a relationship with God. It makes us aware of God's heart to love all people and to care for all people, and we're used by it. We should pray for one another, for sure. James 5 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. We pray for each other. That's why we have intercession groups. That's why we have Bible study groups, where we get to know one another. And what's what your need? How can I pray for you? We pray for another. When there's a need in the church, we usually get a call. Anna will get an email. Oh, we need to pray for this person. They're sick. They're, something happened. You know, we pray for one another. We intercede. What else should we pray for? Matthew 5, 43, our enemies. Do you have enemies? I used to, wor I used to complain about my haters. And Anna said, you're not popular enough to, be, to have haters. You just have dislikers. <laughs> to have a hater, you have to be popular. Well, what did Jesus say? You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father which art in heaven. 
Why did he have to say that? Isn't it more fun to hate our enemies? Isn't it, isn't it more satisfying to just ask that God destroy our enemies? Why did Jesus have to say, love your, love your, Lord, Lord, I mean, couldn't he have said, tolerate your enemies? Why did he say, love your enemies? That's hard. And then pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In another gospel, it says, pray for the happiness of those that hate you. Pray for the happiness of those that hate you. Don't you instinctively do the opposite? Don't we say, God, I'm going to pray for my enemy right now. Make them miserable in Jesus' name. <laughs> That's our instinctive way of praying for people who don't like us. I want you to think of someone that doesn't like you right now. Maybe dislikes you. Maybe makes life difficult for you. Maybe a friend who you've parted ways because something wrong happened. Maybe an ex in your life that makes you miserable. Maybe a boss that's always on your case. Maybe a neighbor that's very difficult. And I want you to ask yourself, can you do this? Can you love them and can you pray for their happiness? Love them and pray for their happiness. What? Jesus is hard. And of course, we're to pray for the harvest. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers for the harvest. Do you notice that there's nothing wrong with the harvest? There's nothing wrong with the sinful world. Jesus said there's plenty of them. The problem with great commission stuff and kingdom stuff is not the sinners that are out there. The problem is there's a lack of workers who are willing to love the sinner enough to be sent into the harvest so that they may know who Jesus is. You know, denomination I worked for many years ago made a very, I would say by now, and they agree with me, a big mistake uh, back in the 60s. Back in the 60s, this denomination owned property in San Francisco. They decided that San Francisco was becoming immoral. So they figured they could sell the property in San Francisco by multiple properties in the suburbs and have more churches that way. So they did. They sold it for millions and millions, were able to put churches in the suburbs far away, far, like in farming, Manteca, you know, um, out there. Antioch back then was nothing. There's nothing there. That's where they put all their churches. Do you know now this denomination wishes they could do ministry again in San Francisco, but can no longer afford the property there? because they tried to escape it when it was getting immoral. I get this all the time. Pastor Ed, why are you still in San Francisco? There's more opportunities to do pastoral work in other states. There's other states in the country that are more friendly to churches. And my answer is, then therefore they don't need me. I don't need to move to another state where people love churches and love God. Work's done. This is work. This is missions. This is the harvest. We need to be among the lost. We need to be among the sinners. Because if we walk away from this, who's left to take care of them? Who's going to love them? Who's going to tell them about Jesus? Who's going to share the gospel to them? Is it going to cost us a lot to do that? Yes, we're paying incredible mortgages and rent just to live among sinners, but it's worth the price if it means leading people to Jesus. Because we cannot pray for the harvest but not be part of the harvest. We have to participate in it. One last question, very quick. How should we pray? Let me give you just very quick insight. We should pray as a child. That's the first one. When Jesus taught us to pray, what's the first line he taught us? Our Father, which art in heaven. No one has ever taught prayer this way up to this point. 
the great rabbis of Israel, they would have, they told their people how to pray all the time. But it was always, Baruch Hashem Adonai, O Great One, Yahweh Elohim, El Shaddai. It was always about the greatness of God. It was always about the distance of God. It was always the fact that God was far away and, and, and all powerful. But Jesus said, when you talk to God, say, Our Father, Our Father, Dad. To me, that first line is the most powerful line of the Lord's Prayer. To, to come to a God who is scary and mighty and powerful and has such a thing as wrath and vengeance in his mind for those who disobey and yet to be able to come to him and say, Our Father. So we need to pray as a child all over again. Just speak to your father the way you would. We need to pray with persistence. In Luke's version of this story, it says, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and anyone who seeks finds. And anyone who knocks, it will be open. Do you give up on the first prayer unanswered? You know, George Mueller was a, a missionary and a... Uh, a man who did a lot of ministry among orphans, he had six best friends. And he prayed every day that all six of his best friends would come to Jesus. Every day he would pray. In his lifetime, five came to know the Lord. One did not. George Mueller died. But a few months after he died, that sixth person came to Jesus. In the end, his prayer was answered. Sometimes your prayer will be answered in your lifetime. Sometimes it will be pray answered after your lifetime. But just keep praying. Just keep praying. You don't have to be the personal witness to the answer to prayer. You just need to lift it up to God with persistence. And if you're praying in His will, then keep praying. We should pray by faith. You know, this one's difficult to understand because we can't take it literally. But Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, move, be taken and thrown into the sea, it will happen. I've never thrown a mountain to a sea. But he's talking about having the faith to even say such things. The faith to dare ask God for things. Alexander the Great was traveling the roads from the east to the west one time, and they happened to pass by a peasant. They stopped. And the peasant said, Alexander, is that you? He says, I am, that I have something to ask of you. Alexander says, make your request known. The man said, can I have 10,000 pieces of gold? Alexander's assistant shoved the peasant back. He says, how dare you ask for something so crazy? Who are you to ask him that? Alexander said, no, bring him back. Because this man honors me with such a request. He believes I'm capable of giving to him the very thing that he asks. He dared ask. If you knew you were talking to the God who created the heavens and the earth, what are you going to ask? Lord, give me a nice car. That's it? That's it? He's the God of the universe. He can answer any prayer, anything in his will, anything that is, is going to glorify him and the kingdom, and all you want is a car? How small is your mind? New clothes? A bigger house? Those are the things we ask for, knowing that He's the God of the universe. There's surely greater things than that. That's why I said the reason we need a sermon on prayer is because a lot of our understanding on prayer is misguided and too small. We ask for things too little and too small that it does not honor who He is and what He's capable of. We should ask in faith. And finally, prayer should be a way of life, right? I read this earlier. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. I wonder if you've ever heard of a woman by the name of Elizabeth Elliot. 
Elizabeth Elliot? Probably not. But you might have heard of her husband, Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot was one of the five missionaries that went to Ecuador in 1955. They tried to reach what we knew then as the Auca Indians of Ecuador, a very savage tribe, a very primitive tribe. As Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and all the other missionaries went to the Auca tribe in Ecuador, they would always check in by radio to headquarters, and one day they stopped checking in. Headquarters waited the next day, they didn't call. So the U.S. Um, military was asked to investigate what was going on. And so they sent the Air Force there, they sent people there. They were nowhere to be found, but in a couple of days, all the five bodies of these missionaries were found in different places, all speared to death. They were killed by the Aukas because the Aukas thought that they were a Western threat to their lifestyle. They didn't understand that they were there for Jesus. The five, they were known as the Ecuador Five. The five of them all had military training. A lot of them fought in World War II. All of them had guns. But they made a commitment. These guns are not for people. These guns are, if we get attacked by an animal or this, that, in self-defense, we will use our guns. But they made a commitment. We will not use our guns on people. They could have won the battle between spears and guns, but they did not use their guns. Instead, all Ecuador five died by the spear at the hands of the Auca Indians. Elizabeth Elliot was now a widow. Eventually, they were able to make contact with the tribe that killed the Ecuador five. And Elizabeth, with another wife and a sister of one of the missionaries, went into that tribe and started to minister to the people as missionaries. Elizabeth's specialty, she was a Greek major in seminary. And so she started to translate the Bible from Greek to the, the language of the Auka people. She had to learn their language, she had to understand, and then create a Bible for them. And so the Aukas now had the word of God. As a result of their ministry, many in the Auka tribe became followers of Jesus Christ and became leaders and elders in the church. Eventually, Elizabeth came back to the United States, worked as a professor at a seminary. And if you've ever read the New International Version, anyone here read the NIV? Elizabeth Elliot was one of the contributing scholars to the NIV. Even though life did not turn out the way she planned, she had planned to be with her husband for life. She had planned to be a co-missionary with him for life. She planned to have more kids with him. They planned to just retire as a missionary couple that was interrupted by the death of her husband. Elizabeth eventually wrote many books. In one of her books, this is what she said. To pray... Thy will be done. I must be willing, if the answer requires it, for my will to be undone. Should I read that again? If you're going to pray, thy will be done, then you must be willing, if the prayer requires it, for your will to be undone. And maybe the one obstacle to answered prayer in your life today is your unwillingness for your will to be undone because you're not really serious about telling God, thy will be done. You're holding on to something too dear and it's the one thing you're not willing to give up. God, you can do anything to me, but don't touch this. God, you can send me anywhere but not there. God, you can call me to perform a task but not this task. That is going to keep you from an answered prayer. How come? Because prayer at its core is relational. And if you're not going to be in relationship with God to the point that you are fully surrendered to Him, then don't pray. Did you hear that? 
Christ invites you to pray. But if you're not going to come with a spirit of commitment and surrender, don't pray. Because you're going to waste your time. Pray because you want to know him more. Pray, as John the Baptist said, so that he will increase and I will decrease. Pray because, in the end, it is the most amazing relationship outside of your spouse, outside of your favorite human. Your relationship with God will be the greatest relationship you will ever pursue so that you don't need to see him as anything other than a father that cares for you. And you don't have to resent him and you don't have to hate him and you don't have to be in disgust with the bad work that you think he's doing in this world. Because when you know him as a father in heaven, you will understand his heart, you will understand his love, you will understand his care and you will align yourself to who he is so much so that if you abide in him and his word abides in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Because we say first, thy will be done. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we, we hear your invitation today. You, you tell us to pray. And maybe there was a time when we thought that means we need to kneel down and talk a lot. But today I understand when you invite me to pray, you want me to deepen my relationship with you. To know the heart of my Father in heaven. To be so filled with your Spirit that I'm able to pray without ceasing so that everything I do and anywhere I am is an opportunity to commune with you. To pray with you in a quiet place to pray to you in a moment of crisis, to express my concern when I don't know what to do, to seek your healing when I am sick, or simply to just enjoy your presence in quiet because I know that you are here with me. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for communion for fellowship, for community between me and you. Thank you for making it possible that I can speak to the God who created the heavens and the earth and say to him, our Father, my Father. And may we never take this relationship for granted, God. Broaden our thinking so that we don't limit our prayers just to asking for better cars or nicer homes or more fashionable clothes or more tasty food. For these are but the base things of this world and the interests of your kingdom are much more grand and much more noble. Teach us to pray for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies, to love them as you love a world that has sinned against you. Teach us to ask for things that are not only for my good, but for the good of humanity in the world that you created. Teach me to say, thy will be done, even if it means that my will will be undone. Find in me a surrendered spirit a committed soul, a trusting child, all for the glory of the Christ who loves me, died for me, and has given me life everlasting. I owe my existence to you, and I wish to live only for your glory from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. So far, we've looked at two commands, repent. Today, we've learned there's a command and an invitation to pray. I hope you're taking these seriously as you walk with God, as you think about what to do. And the next time I come to this pulpit, I'll give you yet a third thing 
that Jesus is going to tell us to do. But in the meantime, work on the two first. I don't want to give you more than you can handle. Before we send you off today and go back into prayer for the game, I'd like to give you an invitation to give to the Lord in response to how the Lord has blessed you. There is an envelope in a seat pocket in front of you. You can use that to put a, a love offering, a gift, a contribution for the work that we do. If you'd rather give online, just look at the screen. You can pull out your devices and go to either Pop Money, Venmo, the Zelle apps, uh, or if you have none of these, just go to our website, bridgepointcc.com. Click on Give in the menu bar. You'll be directed to a very secure site. However you choose to give today, remember you're giving as an act of worship, as a way of thanking God for what he has given to us. Our ushers are coming at this time to receive your gifts. Chuck, Chuck, you know, you know I'm going to do it. So. so, I 
I see lots of red on. We got the red behind us. So let's think of a verse that might speak to the 49ers. It's Joshua 10:8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Um, and as Pastor said, or Ed said earlier, there's probably someone, middle-aged, handsome, charming man in Philadelphia saying the same thing right now. So um, it could go either way. But uh, let's think of that verse. As we pray, let's bow our heads. God, like you said to Joshua, do not be afraid. No matter who is put in front of us, what causes us anxiety, what causes us fear, you put them there for a reason. So be with us as we deal with all those things and those situations in life. And thank you for bringing us together today at Bridge Points. We can be here, hear a message that we may give so others can be helped as well. Amen. All right. Time to wrap up our worship service. I invite you all to stand as we sing our final song. Um.